Joey Harjo is an alum of the university. She received her MFA from the Iowa Writers Workshop in 1978, and she is the current U.S. Poet Laureate, the first Native American to hold the position of U.S. Poet Laureate. An internationally renowned performer and writer of the Muskegee Creek Nation, Harjo has written nine books of poetry, several plays and children's books, and a memoir. She has received numerous honors, including the Poetry Foundation's Ruth Lilly Poetry Prize, the Poets and Writers Jackson Poetry Prize, an Academy of American Poets Wallace Stevens Award, and a Guggenheim Fellowship. Harjo's memoir, Crazy Brave, won several awards, including the Penn USA Literary Award for Creative Nonfiction and the American Book Award. Additionally, she is a renowned musician and performs internationally with her band, The Aerodynamics, which has recorded five award-winning albums. Okay, so I have several questions for you about Iowa. Um, Iowa is something that all of us have in common and we all love. Uh, you were born in Tulsa, Oklahoma and attended the Iowa Writers Workshop. How did you find your way to the workshop? I was, I wound up uh, taking, I was an art major, a studio I'm within at like six, uh, six degrees of a studio art degree at the <laughs> University of New Mexico. And I, I got into poetry. I always loved poetry. I read it. And um, I came to poetry through my mother's songwriting. And then I, um, I wound up being in the first undergrad creative writing major class at the University of New Mexico and decided that I think MFAs were fairly, they weren't com as common as they are now. And there were very few really MFA programs in the country, but Iowa was considered the best. And so I applied and I came, and I came, I, I was offered, I, I think I applied to four places total. Uh, everyone else offered me fellowships, teaching assistantships, money, and Iowa didn't offer me anything along those lines. Oh my, I, put my, I put my children in my, my truck and uh, we came to Iowa and I got help. They had a program there for ethnic, uh, what was it called? And I wound up teaching anyway through, uh, I got a job teaching American studies and I taught uh, native literature as a way to teach culture and teach American studies. Oh, that's but, great. Yeah. No, the program had the best reputation. The best, so, you know, yeah. the best reputation, but not as much funding as the other programs. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. <laughs> I made that choice because the other places were all, uh, I, I've always been, you know, Oklahoma. I went to school, I went to Indian school, the Institute of American Indian Arts, which was a experimental sure. high school for the arts and, and post-grad. I went there during a time that sh shifted, you know, native art in the uh, world art scene. So it was a very exciting time. I got my high school degree there and then later went to the University of New Mexico majoring in art and then poetry kind of um, took over. But uh, I guess what I was trying to say is that it, it was, um, you know, there was a good, everyone, you know, Iowa was the program to, to go to. And, and uh, you know, I think it was a good decision. It wasn't the easiest, but <laughs> I, I know what I was gonna say. All the other places were, were full of native people. University of New Mexico, wow. we had like 300 native students. And at the other places I applied all had, were in native, heavily native populations. But when I went to Iowa, there were seven native students in the whole school. Wow. Wow. Yeah, only seven. And then nearby, I got to know the Meskwaki. That's how I got to know Ray Young Bear. And a lot of the Meskwaki people was, it was the closest native community. Wow. That must have been completely challenging and interesting. Um, do you have any especially vivid memories from your time as a grad student here? Yeah, I have. There were several. I started listing some, and one of them 
One of them was finding Audre Lorde's book, Cole, in the university bookstore and standing there reading her book. I write about it. I, during the pandemic, I wrote a new memoir and I, uh, I, I recorded a new album of music. And um, I was thinking about that, thinking about finding her book, Cole. And, and then one of the, I think that the, the memory that has the most color in it and most um, excitement with possibility is that party that Jack Leggett used to have at the beginning of the year of every, you know, every year and to welcome, you know, welcome the new students, welcome back people and, and out at his farm. And I still see that. I mean, to me, it, I, I feel that it, there are so many people I met there for the first time who I've known for years since then. And I just see it like almost like an impressionistic painting, you know, with all this filled with the hope and possibility, you know. Of, and I remember I met, um, there were several, I met Sarah Vogan, the fiction writer there, uh, Stephanie Vaughn, fiction writer, Campbell wow. Bonnie, Sandra Cisneros, Dennis Mathis, Rosalind Drexler, who was going to teach that fall, became a good friend of mine. And then um, I remember Jane Ann Phillips and we're still friends, you know, with her long hair and her beautiful dog. And I don't know, I just, and I was the only one with children, I noted which gave me a different kind of experience too, you know, trying to navigate all of that. And then being in a place that was, it was like going to another country. Sandra Cisneros has really fond memories of you at the workshop. She remembers you as being very mature, like a person she could look up to, who helped her a lot. And she was so impressed that you had kids when you were here. Um, she, she speaks so fondly of you at that time when you were in the poetry program together. We, yes, I think that we were both the two natives. Although I remember Penny, uh, Mindy Pennybacker too from Hawaii. And there was Gail Harada in poetry also from, she was from Hawaii and from Honolulu. And, um, but yeah, so we were in the earliest, we took some classes together and had some kind of difficult experiences. I think when you come in, um, I know for me, I think it's hard for anybody coming in from a place where you were the best one of your program and then <laughs> suddenly you're in a place where uh, there are people that have been, I realized that there are people that have been studying poetry for years and years and I've been an art major and I felt a little handicapped that way and then being culturally different that was the hardest part, I think. And Sandra and I bonded, I think, a lot over that because even then her experience was different, but we've become lifelong friends. That's you know, so we still, we've had periods where we're not in touch much. And then lately we've been, you know, as we've gotten older too, we, we stay in touch. She's living in Mexico. She has come back to Iowa a couple of times in the last few years. I've seen her twice here. And it's been so great because I think that Iowa was a challenge for her. And then she's yes. now remembering that she had really significant experiences her, here. Like, and she's come back to just be here uh, a couple of times. Um, you, you, you were here at a, at a stage in your life where you had already experienced a lot of like an art, visual art form, and you were also very musical and had, you know, your mom's music in you and uh, poetry was sort of an outgrowth, it sounds like, of those things. Um, how, how did your time here in the poetry program at Iowa prepare you uh, for a life as a poet? Well, it prepared me. I was, that program is very competitive. At least that's how, it, there was a lot of competitiveness and I didn't come up through poetry like that. Maybe I just didn't think about it and maybe I was just lucky. I mean, it just kind of, I started writing and there it was. And I was doing my own thing. I didn't write like anyone else. Uh, yeah. And that can be difficult when nobody really knows what you're doing. Sure. And yet I could tell people at some point, there was a point where I lost myself. I started trying to write like everyone else. And of course that fell flat. And then I just decided, well, I, I'm going to be who I am. So was that useful? Like sort of learning to stick to your guns? Was it useful for you when you 
graduated from Iowa and became a poet in the world? Yes. Uh, in fact, I'd written a, a little, yeah, it was like I, I came to learn to deal with poetry on my own terms. And maybe that's what all writing programs ultimately, I think so. <laughs> you know, do, because I've taught the last place was university. I had a chair of excellence at University of Tennessee, Knoxville with PhD students and the one who helped me. I brought on an anthology project, a Norton anthology I did that just came out. And, and they were, um, yeah, I watched them and I was with them. I'm still in touch with most of them, you know, coming to poetry in their own terms. And I think that's part of it, even though a lot of us who felt we were on the outside um, I th I've come to realize talking with other, other poets that I thought really were on the in crowd, so to, to use an old term, uh, <laughs> use an antiquated term, uh, where it felt like they were also on everybody. <laughs> everybody felt like they were on the outside. <laughs> That's what I came to know. And that could be the nature of writing programs. But one thing, when the U.S. Poet Laureateship was announced about a month or two later, I got a, an email from Marvin Bell. And, uh, you know, I wasn't particularly close to him in the writing workshop, but I knew him. He said, you know, he congratulated me. And then he said something about almost like, well, he, he didn't really help me. They didn't really help me much. Or I we probably didn't know what to do with me. You know? <laughs> and, and I appreciated that. I mean, it meant a lot to me all these years because I did feel on the outside so much. And yet I used that to grow myself. And then... Um, and then I wrote him back. I said, yeah, well, maybe it wasn't the best fit, but I wouldn't have had it. You know, it was what exactly what I needed. But I really appreciated him writing. And one person who was very good to me, and it was somebody, you know, fictionalized, made up, you know, I wrote you that letter of that story where somebody had kind of made up a whole story that yes. was not out of untruths. Uh, probably to make a good story for what every case they were making. I didn't read their book, but um, Donald Justice was the one poet there who was teaching there. He was the one poet who sat with me and went over my poetry with me carefully, as if it mattered. He was the one, the one, you know, and I had classes with some good poets who were, you know, like, well, I had a really good class with William Matthews, and I had that class with Sandra, and that's the class that inspired her house on Mingo Street. Oh, wow. And it had to do with spaces in Bachelard, but it was that book. Oh, yeah, the, the Poetics of uh, Space. Uh, yeah, that po book was central to that class. Oh, how interesting. Yeah. They still, I mean, people are still reading it in, in MFA programs. It's so interesting that it's the same thing. But yeah. that's amazing that Donald Justice is the person who really went over your work with you. He was such a great teacher. Oh, so many Iowa alums of the workshop, and particularly some people who, who are still at the workshop cite him as being so, such an important teacher to them. Um, uh, I wanted to ask you about the Native Poetry Anthology that you put together for Norton. It's called, when the, for, for, the, for those of you in the audience, um, Joy Harjo is the editor of a new and historically comprehensive Native poetry anthology called When the Light of the World Was Subdued, Our Songs Came Through. Um, and it's a groundbreaking anthology that includes centuries of work by Native American poets, including oral literature. And I wanted to ask you if you could tell us a little bit about how you chose and organized the contents of the anthology. Well, it's really different. There's a new review in La uh, Los Angeles Review of Books that I just read by Dean Rader, and he really gets it. And I, lo I love that he got it because it's, it's arranged differently. It's not arranged by superstars or chronologically, but it's arranged by place. Oh, nice. Instead of saying, you know, we, we organized ourselves according to place. I mean, our place organized us because it has so much. It doesn't matter even if you live in a city place and, and what's grown there and how you, you know, the, the climate and how you relate really has a lot to do with our, with, you know, our poetry, our literature and um, in very intrinsic ways. So that's how we, that's how we organized, organized at beginning because in uh, the Muscogee Creek people, we start with, when we do the direction, some people go counterclockwise, some go clockwise, we go uh, 
counterclockwise. So we start with the east, uh, north, west, south. And so we decided because three of us, the three central editors, we decided that, well, we should be nice and we'll go last. <laughs> so we were the southeast. So we let, we, we placed the north, east, midwest, Pacific, northwest, Alaska, Hawaii, and then west, um, southwest, and, and well, plains and mountains after the or up there second. Anyway, that's how we organized it. And then we organized it by, you know, from pieces we have uh, an excerpt of the Kumulipo Hawaiian creation chant. Oh. It's a very small section of it translated. That's probably, it's an older piece in there and other trends. So we started with, in each area, we started with those kinds of pieces and moved through, but we still have some people write in their own languages and we still, you know, within the whole body. So it it's chronological within the geographic section. And uh, yeah, and as he pointed out, it's not about, we don't have a lot of poems for a poet, some poets and not, we've eliminated it two or three because what we were wanting in this anthology is scope. There has not been an anthology like this one. It sounds amazing. I love the idea of putting oral poetry from each geographic part at the beginning of its section. That's incredible. Yeah, it really, and I think it works pretty well And that. So I have another Norton anthology coming out um, in May, which is connected to the Library of Poetry uh, Laureate Library of Congress um, project, which is a, uh, it's called Living Nations, Living Words. And it's directly related to um, the story map that will be, um, I think it's going to be live in a couple of weeks, which is a story map. It shows the earth and North America, including Hawaii and the islands as without political boundaries. Oh, it's wow. so exciting to that see it that way because- they, That is so exciting. Well, yeah. I mean, I, I'm, I'm aware that this is, you've been reappointed as Poet Laureate, correct? You were yeah. first chosen in 2019, and now you are again chosen in 2020, and you're the first Native American to become U.S. Poet Laureate. And I understand that this project that you're working on is part of the reason they wanted you to stay in the position of Poet Laureate, so that you could continue to make sort of a, to just, make more public and make more sort of clear and open to everybody all about um, about your your poetry project. Um, how, how, what is the ultimate sort of uh, vision of that project and when do you think you'll be completed? Oh, we still have more to do because there's going to be a whole uh, teacher's resources part of it too. Oh, great. But uh, the anthology will be out in, like I said, in May, and it's contemporary poets. So when you click on a marker, a poet, an image will come up and you'll hear the poet read. So it, they have another whole collection now at the Library of Congress that are poets, Native poets reading. There's going to be there. There's a... For so is the anthology going to be available as a book and online? Yes. Okay. So there'll be an online map that anyone anywhere in the world can access. It's a digital map. But it gets it's so frustrating because what I said, okay, I want to put all the native poets and then then we're connected to everybody. We know everybody and you know, not just native poets, but if you could show all the lines of connection and say, yeah, but you know, here's, and we all have poetry ancestors. So here's a Walt Whitman over here is gonna be every American poet's poetry ancestor and native poets and the old, and then they connect to people in Europe, to, to China, to all over. And I said, that's the kind of map I wanna do. And it's like, oh, wait a minute, you know, capacity. <laughs> yeah, but yeah. That's the challenge is like, this was so exciting. And we didn't put everybody, I mean, we, there's, there's, they have a wonderful staff, but there was a staff of two working on this and me, and there's so much. And then we, we pulled in, I've always loved geography. So when I got the job, I said, I want to see, I've always wanted to go into the Library of Congress and see. So they give, when I go over there, I get all these tours and get to see what's there. It's quite exciting. Sounds and uh, yeah, so we involved the geography department and then the 
the the pro the department that does is is holding now we have a whole uh digital you know collection of native poets reading their poetry and talking about place that's so amazing do you think this is one of the most exciting times in your entire career being the poet laureate i think yes it is and it's kind of you know for years people knew me because of my poetry but i up until a few years ago i'd never won my books haven't they still haven't won poetry prizes huh. and um you know, not, I, I've built a career and I don't even think of it as necessarily career, but I guess it is, it just is. on reputation, <laughs> you know, because I do what I do and I travel and I speak and it's just kind of been built that way. And it's not until like the last few years that my poetry started to get recognized. And of course, then the U.S. Poet Laureate, it certainly ups the ante, ups the ante quite a bit, but, um, yeah. Yeah, so it is. And it's what's interesting is that suddenly within a year, I'll have two Norton anthologies, which is two, wow. Norton, two Norton anthologies, uh, a new memoir called Poet Warrior, A Call for Love and Justice. It's about twice as long as Little Crazy Brave. And, uh, and it's different. People think it's my best. And then um, my, and then, um, and then a new album of music with some really fine musicians. It's good. I'm really excited about it. And I already have a, you know, it's, I've got a team already set up for that. And, That's amazing. And then, uh, then I plan, I started sketching and my plan was, I had already, I had told my agent, I don't want to do very many interviews. This was right before I heard about, I was told I was the next U.S. Poet Laureate. I, I don't want to do any more interviews. <laughs> I have a Tulsa Artist Fellowship. I'm going to start painting. I gave me a nice studio. And uh, I'm going to start painting for a while. And then uh, I got the news and that, you know, <laughs> that it shifted in the pandemic. Yeah. So the pandemic and then the racial uh, unrest and the, again, the opening of the wound and the question, the deep questioning that we're all, you know, because the pandemic too is also engenders deep questioning about meaning and, and uh, earth and our place on earth as human beings. So in a minute, I'm going to ask you to give a reading from your work. But before I do that, I have to ask you this one last question. What advice would you give young writers that wish to follow in your footsteps? Well, first I would tell them don't follow in my footsteps. <laughs> They have, they have their own footsteps, and that's really important because you cannot, I, I see this, and I've seen it with my students, I saw it when I was a student, is comparing yourself to someone else. Oh, yeah. And that will get you nowhere because you're not someone else. You are your own self. It's like when I picked up a saxophone and I was almost 30, or 40, I was almost 40. It's like, what the heck, you, I'm just, this is what I want to do. This is what I'm doing. Or like becoming a poet. When, <laughs> you know, you have to follow your own, it's, it's important to be yourself to follow your own path. I mean, yes, people inspire. That's what's a lot in my new memoir. People inspire, like Audre Lorde. There are many others I write in Scott Momaday, who I first met when I was a student at Iowa, who inspire. And so you, you learn from them, your poetry ancestors. We have a lot of different kinds of ancestors. And you know, you get inspired by them, but you're making, you're here because you have your own path to make. It's not someone else's path. And so it's important to listen. I mean, basically what we're doing is sharpening our skill of listening, you know, as writers, as poets, as, as human beings, and to read and, and, you know, just take time, unplug. Yeah. That's wonderful. Um, would you be at this moment willing to read to us? Yes, I'm going to read this one. I was thinking, what do I have about Iowa? And this one isn't about being at Iowa, but I was flying over Iowa thinking about it, about those winters. <laughs> I mean, Oklahoma has winters, but not like that. And I was reminded when... Um, Linda, what was her name? She passed. Wonderful teacher there at Iowa brought me in. And I was reminded again of how those winters, I remember having to go to school. It was 80 below wind chill factor and did the University of Iowa 
good. <laughs> stop no, classes. No. They never stop classes. <laughs> oh, I remember having to take my battery out, take it inside, <laughs> all of that. And then, so this poem is called Grace. And uh, it's for, I see, for Darlene Wynn. She was one of my friends. She was a student at the University of Iowa. She was uh, Chippewa and uh, was raised in Iowa by, she had been adopted out as a, as a native, young Native woman. And she was one of my friends. We were part of the, if you called it then, the Chicano Indian Center. And then James, James Welch, because I'm thinking of his sideways wit in his poetry and his fiction. And um, so this is about, Actually, this poem came about, I think I started writing it on a napkin in one of those, uh, what is it called, those um, pancake, that uh, Perkins pancake, what is it, cake and steak, it was out west of Iowa City, I mean it was, it was a place you'd go to on a Sunday for a special breakfast out, and I had been counting the days, I did, I kept a calendar of cloudy days, <laughs> and there had been a month with no sun and I come from a sun culture <laughs> you know it was like and then I remember we were sitting in there a bunch of us from the workshop and who came the sun and this is kind of about that and and about how sometimes those winters were hard they were hard to get through and uh, and sometimes we didn't do it grac very gracefully <laughs> grace I think of wind and her wild ways, the year we had nothing to lose and lost it anyway in the cursed country of the fox. We still talk about that winter, how the cold froze imaginary buffalo on the stuffed horizon of snowbanks. The haunting voices of the starved and mutilated broke fences crashed our thermostat dreams and we couldn't stand it one more time. So once again, we lost a winter in stubborn memory walked through cheap apartment walls, skated through fields of ghosts into a town that never wanted us in the epic search for grace. Like coyote, like rabbit, we could not contain our terror and clowned our way through a season of false midnights. We had to swallow that town with laughter so it would go down easy as honey. And one morning, as the sun struggled to break ice, and our dreams had found us with coffee and pancakes. We found Grace. I could say Grace was a woman with time on her hands or a white buffalo escaped from memory. But in that dingy light, it was a promise of balance. We once again understood the talk of animals and spring was lean and hungry with the hope of children and corn. I would like to say with Grace, we picked ourselves up and walked into the spring thaw. We didn't. The next season was worse. You went home to Leech Lake to work with the tribe and I went south and wind. I am still crazy. I know there is something larger than the memory of a dispossessed people. We have seen it. So that's in honor of Iowa winters. <laughs> yeah. And then what you find to survive. I guess I'll read one more. This one's called An American Sunrise. This is also sounds like a party poem, but <laughs> they're not all like that. <laughs> An American Sunrise. This is from the book American Sunrise, which was uh, is basically, I wrote this when I was uh, teaching at University of Tennessee, Knoxville. And um, was getting ready, and I took the job for a few reasons, but I wanted to be back in our home territory where we were before we were removed by the U.S. government to Oklahoma. And so my husband, who's also my same tribal nation, we drove all over. I even found a house belonging to one of my a great uncle. You know, a lot of people have these weird images of natives that you know were human beings that have nothing to do with who we are. And yes, we had houses, we had land, we had mansions even, and. Andrew Jackson and his friends decided they wanted, wanted them for their, themselves. Uh, let's see. So this is, uh, so this book came out of that. I, we were getting ready to leave and I looked out into the, the beautiful Smoky Mountains and I, my spirit asked me, what did you learn here? An American Sunrise. 
We were running out of, okay, next, it's part of a golden shovel form invented by Terence Hayes. And so the last line of the poem, the last word of each line uh, is uh, part of a line from Gwendolyn Brooks, a Gwendolyn Brooks poem, which I think if you know her poetry, you might recognize it. We were running out of breath as we ran to meet ourselves. We were servicing the edge of our ancestors' fights and ready to strike. It was difficult to lose days in the Indian bar if you were straight. Easy if you played pool and drank to remember to forget. We made plans to be professional and some of us could sing. When we drove to the edge of the mountains with a drum, we made sense of our beautiful crazed lives under the starry stars. Sin was invented by the Christians as was the devil we sang. We were the heathens but needed to be saved from them. Thin chance. We all knew we were all related in the story. A little gin will clarify the dark and make us all feel like dancing. We had something to do with the origins of blues and jazz. I argued with the music as I filled the jukebox with dimes in June. Four years later, we still want justice. We are still America. We. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for sharing your work with us. It's a real honor to hear you read. Now I get the pleasure of asking some questions from the audience who've been putting them into the chat. And I'd like to start with this one. Is there a poet or a specific, specific poems that you have been reading during these times that have been inspiring or motivational? Um, I mean, during the quarantine, during this pandemic and these particular times. Let's see, there's been a lot. I'm trying to figure out where to start. I wish I had, I should have put some things here in hand. I've been reading uh, Natalie Diaz's A Post-Colonial Love, Love Poem. And have thought about it a lot. Of course, she always raises these questions really about who we are as humans and, and uh, you know, what's love got to do with it? <laughs> Tina Turner, really. I mean, it is, if you think about it, it's, you know, we're all making a story and in a way it's, um, we're at a point in the relationship with our relationship with this country and with the earth. And it's like, so, so, you know, what are we going to do in this post-colonial period, which is haunted by colonialism, <laughs> you know, by, you know, wh who are we, who are we becoming individually as um, generation? Because every gen I see every generation as a kind of person and, um, who are we becoming as a, as a nation? Who are we becoming as a planet? So I think her poetry fits right in with that. It's not easy and she asks really hard, really difficult questions. Thank you. What are you listening to right now, musically? Oh man. I've been listening to Wayne Shorter a lot. Old things, old, some of his older performances is Wayne Shorter. I've been listening to Gil Scott here, and I've been working on my album too. And we've got, it's kind of has a Gil Scott here and vibe, but it's different. It's, it's its own thing. And I'm singing in part of it, and then reading, po reading, singing, singing underneath, playing horn, and all of that. I I listen to everything. I always like, uh, and especially in this time, is a new Surat Ali Fadi, new Surat Ali. Ali Fadi Khan. I remember being in India when he passed, but there were, it was probably a year where he was all the only person I listened to. So a lot of, I mean, I'll think of a lot, and I always listen to James Brown. <laughs> He's like, James yeah. Brown was yeah. He's like the, he calls himself the godfather of soul, but if you look at music ancestors, which are part of poetry ancestors, I think of John Coltrane being a, a certainly a poetry and a horn ancestor, you know, there's, and you always go back to Louis Armstrong. Well, you know, I think uh, James Brown is another one of those branches. 
one of our questioners wants to know if you would tell us a little about your band. Right now, my band is whoever I pull together. And I've gone out with a band I call um, Aerodynamics Band. And now it's usually, um, that, that configuration is often Larry Mitchell. He plays, he plays a lot online now. He's a wonderful guitarist. And um, it's with him and then uh, Robert Muller, keyboards, all New Mexico people. And uh, I played with them the US Poet Laureate inaugural performance, Howard Bass not Howard Bass, uh, uh, Howard Cloud. Howard Bass used to work for the Smithsonian. <laughs> yeah, I was Howard Cloud. And uh, they and so they were with me for my, I was the only US Poet Laureate that had a whole band and then played in the band. <laughs> you know, was, I read poetry and played. So right now I'm, the album is, um, he was part of Screaming Trees and part of that whole um, Seattle scene and has recorded a lot of world music, all kinds of music is Barrett Martin. So the album is basically him and me, and then we've pulled in different guest artists like Peter Buck of R.E.M. and uh, Mike McCready of uh, Pearl Jam and some other special guests that, to play. And then I had two, two uh, stepdaughters singing with me on a song Stomp All Night, you know, so. So I go out, it depends on where I play. I can, there's people, if I go to New York, there's people there I can pull in. Um, it just depends. There are way too many questions um, for me to ask them all to you. So I'm sorry for people who don't get their questions answered, but I want to ask this one because it's somewhat related to music. Um, hearing you read, hearing Ms. Harjo read, she adds a powerful rhythm to her work. When you write, do you think about the poetry in written form, in oral form, or in both? You know what I realized, because I was reading on one of these things, I've been doing a lot of these virtuals, and then reading, and then also playing music, and, and I love improvising, jazz improv, my own stuff, jazz improv, and then I, is that that I, I write in, that I've always written according to rhythm, I mean, I, I've learned, to, I'm learning to play bass during the pandemic too. And I realized <laughs> I've always organized. I mean, we all, our, our poetry is really about organize. You know, we organize it. There's lines, there's phrases, there's sound qualities, you know, et cetera, et cetera. But I realized how much I have depended. There's a certain kind of patterning that holds through when I play saxophone, or flute, or that, uh, you know, I'm always, it's, I'm, rhythmic. I'm always dancing or moving with rhythms. It's interesting. I've, um, I, uh, my friend, I have a friend Esperanza. She's a singer and a bass player. And she always, when I'm around her, she always sings. She's always singing. And I realize that the way that I move about it, I'm always dancing. I'm always dancing or moving. And I do that in my poetry. It's kind of, it's, it's very, rhythm and of course all poetry can write every poem you know may be you know anti-rhythmic or whatever but there's rhythm and so it's always been there you know i realize that a lot of times in my writing it's it's especially rhythmic i think it changed when i started playing music for the first time and in, in uh, when i was almost 40 and then I hear the early recordings from the bands playing and i'm just reading like the monotone somewhat monotone and as I played with the band, my first band, part Poetic Justice, and I started moving more, and then I started singing later on, and so it's shifted. Yeah. I think it's shifted, shifted the poetry some, which takes me that's back so to my mother in music. Yeah, that's wonderful. Well, we really appreciate your taking the time to share with us today. Thank you so much for. Um, speaking with us here in Iowa. And uh, thank you everyone uh, who tuned in today to be here with us.